Okay, so this is the start of a short lecture on chronology and some of the ways that we organize uh, historical time. So 20 minutes or so, um, and after this, you should be able to take your nice chronology quiz, which will just give you a test of reading different dates and translating them into different ways of, of annotating. So to start with, uh, where are we essentially in time? Um, so there's actually multiple calendars in the world and, and um, ways of measuring time. And if you're interested, there's a great Wikipedia page that list some of the calendars um, and where we are in, in those eras. Um, so the one that's used publicly in the US uh, and that we use for this class um, is based on the Julian and Gregorian calendars. Um, so the Julian calendar was actually the Julius Caesar was part of this reform um, in 45 BCE. Uh, and then Pope, I believe, um, Gregory in the 16th century. Um, so this is the one that we work from. Um, the Gregorian calendar adds um, a religious element, which is this idea of counting from the birth of Christ. And so um, year one is identified with the birth year of Jesus Christ. Um, so this means that there's a lot of history before Christ happened, because actually in terms of the ancient world, uh, Jesus Christ lived kind of late, to be honest, um, if we're going to talk about the holes of, of human um, settlements and so forth in the area. Um, this also means that most of what we're doing in the class is counting backwards in some sense towards the year Christ. Um, so if you want to imagine in the larger scale, the beginning of the world or the universe, um, if you can think of that as a moment, the physics, I suppose, um, and then counting backwards. Um, so the earliest we're going to start in class um, is the fourth millennium BCE, uh, and I will try to get us to the second millennium CE. Okay, so when we're counting backwards, um, and you might already have seen this, of course, or know this, um, we talk about years as BC, so before Christ. Um, so more recently, there's been a, a secular rebranding essentially of, of the titles um, where instead of Christ it's common era um, so you say BCE um, so I tend to follow that um, in part because that's more becoming the standard for um, for publications but of course it doesn't actually change the numerical value it just um, changes its its basis or attempts to um, so Traditionally, you know, BC before Christ, and then you have something called AD, uh, which is Latin um, for Anno Domini, year of the Lord. So the idea is that one is Anno Domini. The key to this, and of course you can choose which system within this you prefer writing, so I'm not gonna, you know, if you're um, writing your IDs and you use BC and AD, um, I won't count off for that, of course. Um, but something that I would mark um, is if you use AD after the number, so because AD is Latin, it should go before. Um, now, if you choose to use the secular rebranding, you can just say CE, which is common era. Again, for year one becomes common era. Uh, and that actually is a little simpler in some sense because BCE and CE both come after the date. So sort of up to you how you would like to um, to go forward. So one of the curious things about chronology um, in our history today and the history that we're talking about, um, there's no year zero. So technically we start on 01 is the new uh, century or millennium. So if you're gonna be pedantic, you could argue that currently um, we are just now getting into the start of the 21st century in 2020, but technically it won't really be the start of 20, the 21st century until 2021, which I think is pedantic, but choices. Um, so this means that a lot of the dates um, that we're talking about, since they're backwards, are actually reversing this year one formula, if that makes sense. Um, so this means that the year, the BCE years are going to get smaller. So you start with a larger number and then as you're counting down towards one. Um, so I'm skipping ahead actually to my second text, um, which pause for a second and go back up. I should have mentioned the fourth century. Um, so for a second, going back to CE, 
um, our era. So if we take this back in time um, to the fourth century CE, it starts in 301 and ends in 400. One of the ways that I try to remember this um, is that the, the dates that basically constitute the century are less than the name of the century. So if the fourth century is 301, um, 350, uh, and so, you know, 359, 390, and so forth, um, the year that it ends on, the 400, is what gives the century its name, the fourth century. So, um, and one of the reasons I would like you to know this, besides general knowledge, um, is that there are different ways you'll see of recording time for works of art. And so um, you want to be, have a facility with the different ways of recording time. Okay, um, so now I'm going to um, BCE. Um, so BCE, like I said, is reversing it. Um, so in this case, the start of the century is now the name that it gets. Um, so 400 BCE to 301 BCE is the fourth century. So that means again that you have 350 BCE is the fourth century, 325 BCE is the fourth century and so on. Um, and this is some practice um, for you um, here on my slide. Um, so the 5th century BCE, 500 to 401, the 8th century, 800 to 701, um, the 1st century, 1 to 100, 2nd century, 200 to 101. Um, so the quiz will look exactly like this, essentially. Um, it really just takes practice um, if it's something unfamiliar. Uh, so the other thing that's going to come up in class is periodization, um, and I use this a lot, um, and part of it is my training, um, goes back to my training, we like um, periods and lumps of time in history of art, um, and not without reason, um, although it does get complicated, of course. Um, so it's an abstraction that's convenient, I like language, I talked about with representation in the last lecture. The thing to remember for this class um, when we're talking about ancient culture is that it reflects a modern worldview and not an ancient worldview. And think about right now, like right now um, we're living history and there are a lot of debates on what is even happening right now, for example. Um, and you know, different newspapers have a different sort of sense of, of movements and so forth. Um, so living in history is, you know, at least in the sort of an autocracy or something, you know, it's more fluid. Um, but looking backwards, after you have events that have happened, historians like to have sort of bookends. Uh, it's often problematic. Um, so one term in particular that'll show up over and over again, and I still have colleagues who use it, um, is the so-called Dark Age. Um, so in Greece, and this is really key to Greek art actually, as you'll see, um, there's a break with material culture. Um, and when I say break, I basically mean we have one set of material culture, one set of art and architecture that then doesn't appear to have been used in the same way. So like depopulation is one way to think about this. Um, and it's not until about 800 that you then see, again, new architecture, evidence of trade again with, um, with Egypt and the Near East um, or West Asia. So historians who privilege um, civilization as something that has big buildings, um, writing system, and so forth, would think of a period in which you have less of that activity as something negative. Um, and it's not to say that negative things weren't happening. So you know, during when this age begins, it seems to have began from, began from some kind of cataclysm. Um, possibly multiple on different fronts. Um, so battles, famine, um, maybe plague even. So a lot of things happening at once. Um, and you can point to different um, stories that you might already know where there's these sort of breaks um, with the time that came before. Um, so I tend to use the, um, the, date, the numerical dates a little bit more often to get away from this idea of privileging a certain um, type of group of people over another. Um, so obviously I'm gonna talk about um, the 10th 
the ninth centuries as 10th and ninth centuries um, rather than a so-called um, dark age. But there on the other bullets, um, you see what I'm talking about with the, the, de the destruction. Um, and then what happens in 800 that made historians see Greece proper start essentially. Um, again, I don't want to make it seem like there's no um, basis uh, for those opinions, but just that um, they're, of course, based on a modern bias, and it's good to recognize that. Okay, since we're starting with ancient Egypt, I'm going to show you my nice Ombra ancient Egypt timeline here. So as I I've sort of gestured to already, um, the fourth millennium is really when we start talking about things in this course. Um, but there's human habitation in all of the areas that we are talking about prior to that. So we call this prehistory under the idea that people aren't writing down their history. Which of course doesn't mean they didn't have one. It's more likely an oral culture. If you're interested in talking more about prehistory, happy to talk to you about it during the discussion. Um, so Egypt's timeline based on the pharaohs um, and the dynasty of rulers, essentially, uh, was started in the third century um, CE, um, with a, which is really late, actually, in Egypt's history. Um, and this historian is basically going backwards in time and doing what we do today as professional historians in this class and trying to put things into sort of groupings. So there's actually two parts of the, the timeline from ancient Egypt, which by the way, if anyone is sort of freaking out right now, I'm not going to be asking you to reproduce this timeline. Um, I just want to introduce it to you. So that said, um, so there's really sort of two ways of writing it. And um, my favorite timeline sort of do both, uh, which is to have the color or the sort of big groupings that you see here of proto-dynastic, old kingdom and kingdom and so forth. Uh, and then underneath the dynasty of pharaohs. So, um, you know, for example, in the New Kingdom, the 18th dynasty, so that means there was 18 unique dynasties. Um, and when I talk about dynasties, this usually means hereditary su su succession, but not always. Um, and then the larger periods um, are often bookended with some kind of, again, cataclysm um, or big change, um, so like a, a big battle. Um, so like the late period, one of the things that starts the late period is that you have um, Kushite pharaohs ruling in Egypt. Um, and you can see where our historians are looking at the types of events that were recorded for us um, today or that we've you know, known about for a long time. And so you notice pharaohs and battles are a big part of the timeline. Um, so I'll try to put that into my lectures just to give you some historical context to grab on. Um, and you'll also find it, of course, um, in links uh, to the objects that we talk about. Um, because what actually one of the sort of preview to Egypt, um, one of the other sort of interesting things about looking at art within this timeline of kingdoms is actually the lack of very discernible change. When I say very, I mean it's change that one needs to really be an expert in Egyptian art to see um, because the changes are really subtle over time and tradition was the thing that was most valued. Um, so you would see art in the New Kingdom and later on in the, sorry, in the Old Kingdom and later on in the New Kingdom, artists are working in an extremely similar paradigm. There are changes, of course, um, but again, these are small, so one really needs to like know what they're looking at. Um, so like I, for example, um, coming at this from a classics perspective, um, can probably do about three groupings or so of, of style um, based on just looking at materials and what the overall piece looks like. Um, and we'll talk more about why um, there's a pretty much a lack of, of change and more interest in, in tradition and um, continuity in ancient Egypt. So continuity is the name of the game, even though you have these um, different dynasties ruling and, and periods broken up by changes in borders um, and, and politics. Okay, introducing you to the ancient Greek timeline. I really liked cool colors when I was making this slide. Um, so I'm gonna start talking about ancient Greece um, in a period actually towards the end of the Bronze Age or sort of middle to the end of the Bronze Age. Um, so there's, we can talk about the Bronze Age in ancient Egypt too, um, and actually other civilizations as well. So when you have something like the Bronze Age, it just means that this is the period where bronze metals 
start showing up in the archaeological record, um, which can mean trade depending on where we're talking about or um, organization and people using local resources. Um, so in Greece, that period um, starts around 3000. Um, and actually, Greece was an exporter of bronze at different um, periods. So, so that's why you start with, with Bronze Age um, Greece. Uh, so geometric period, what I talked about earlier is the, the Dark Age, the so-called Dark Age. Um, the other term geometric refers more to the style of art, as we'll see. Um, and then the other periods, um, seventh century I just left as a chronology. Um, so the next two periods, archaic and classical. So these, the, the particularly archaic, I actually think is a great name for a period because it actually goes along with something that the ancient Greeks said about their own time. Um, although when I tell you, you can decide if you think it's useful, um, which is that those peoples who are inhabiting Greece in the fifth century, fourth century, who are looking backwards at works of art that came from the sixth century would have called it archaeos, which just means old. So it's the old period. Um, in our story, it's also going to be the period of art where you have an even bigger revival of interest in um, ancient Egyptian and West um, cultures of West Asia. Um, so that sort of starts happening in the 6th century, but then just kind of like explodes. Um, sorry, starts in the 7th century, but sort of explodes um, in the 6th century BCE. Um, and our story will probably end, um, I'll like a story of chronology probably end in the fifth century. Um, and then I might show you, try to show you some stuff from second century and later. Um, so for writing dates on um, your identifications, um, again, remember you'll have that information on the slides. Um, so it's sort of up to you how you would like to notate it. Um, the main thing I'm looking for is that you have a date and that it is a correct date. Um, so one way I would recommend doing the Egyptian dates, for example, I like to do this because it helps me give a sense of both the numerical dates of something um, and the, the dynasties, the dynastic periods, um, is to do like Old Kingdom slash 2540 BCE so that you're, you're getting both at the same time. Um, or um, in the case of, I'll show you a little centaur, or you have it on your model from the geometric period, um, I might put geometric slash 10th century BCE, 9th century BCE. So that way you're grouping things according to a couple of different systems of notation. Um, and as we get into things, you will see, especially in Greece, um, some distinctive stylistic changes between the periods, um, which is also part of why they get grouped as separate periods. Um, so it may be helpful um, for your thinking and writing to, to use the period names there. Um, so, uh, okay, I'm gonna end our chronology here and we'll talk about Narmer in the next lecture. <laughs>